poignant beacon, Tengawai, a place of weeping waters, a place of tragedy. All that remains of the bridge, the steam engine of Express Train 626, the six carriages and 151 lives that were swept away on that fateful Christmas Eve in 1953, are those two concrete abutments in the water there. Destruction was complete. Ice blocks and boulders and volcanic ash gathered up by the rush of water from Mount Ruapehu's crater lake thundered into the bridge minutes before the train arrived. Was this an act of God? Or was it a probability that engineering design could have provided for? It was known in 1899 that the crater lake had caused flash floods in this valley of the Whangaehu. The engineers who built the North Island main trunk knew this and designed for these. The board of inquiry into the disaster could not fault the engineering process. Design, construction, maintenance, all these had been found proper. What had been completely unforeseen was the probability of such a massive escape of water from the volcano's cone. A flow volume rate equal to the peak flood flow in the Waikato River, squeezed in through here. So the design was not at fault. But if we were to compare the old bridge with the new, how much difference would we find? All bridges are designed with a built-in factor of safety against failure or collapse. If you had enough money, you could build a bridge that would withstand almost any size of catastrophic event. But is this reasonable? At Tangawai, the risks of any bridge being destroyed are indeed still great. What you see in the new bridge is one of reasonable cost with an adequate factor of safety. In considering the balance of probabilities in this particular case, the engineers have provided a further factor of safety, this time some distance upstream. Here, 13 kilometres above Tangawai, is this electronic warning system. If there's any rapid rise in the Wangahu River, it's automatically signalled back to railway traffic control. We really have no idea of how damaging the next breakout from Mount Ruapehu's crater will be, but at least trains will be warned in time to prevent a repeat of 1953. This was the scene of a notable New Zealand bridge problem. Here at the Newmarket Viaduct in Auckland, lessons were learnt that resulted in international changes in concrete box girder bridge design. The problem here was fortunately not a collapse. Again, it was the elements that caused the problem. Alex Stirrett was the chief designing engineer for the Ministry of Works at that time. The problem on Newmarket Viaduct first manifested itself actually during the construction of the bridge. Construction took place between 1964 and 1966. It was a problem that had not been allowed for in the original design of the bridge and was later known as the temperature gradient effect. It first manifested itself during construction of the box girders cantilever erection on either side of the piers um, and it resulted in the ends of the cantilevers sagging uh, during the construction because of the effect uh, of temperature uh, acting on the box girders. The cantilevers were free to deflect and as the deck got hotter during the day then this caused the cantilevers on either side of the piers to sag downwards. How much uh, sag was involved then? Oh, it, it, it amounted to uh, quite a few centimetres, and uh, this was a movement that occurred every day during the construction. After a lot of investigation on the site and on the bridge itself, it was decided that very extensive remedial work would be carried out, and this was done by inserting high tensile steel bars inside the box girders. As a result of the uh, problems on Newmarket Viaduct and the investigations carried out by the Ministry of Works and of Development. A new code of practice was developed and this was one of the first in the world developed on the question uh, of temperature gradient. 
and as a result of this, all major bridges ever since then um, have been designed allowing for the effect of temperature gradient. This was the scene after one of the most destructive forces of nature was unleashed in Hawke's Bay in 1931. The Napier earthquake was the turning point for structural engineering. From this point on, building design was no longer the province of architects. Engineering for earthquake resistance became a high priority. These ruins are not the result of earthquake. They are remnants of a most important development in the engineer's capacity to design for earthquake resistance. This is New Zealand's first cement works, located in Walkworth, north of Auckland. Unreinforced concrete was used widely by Roman builders and engineers, but after the fall of Rome, the art of cement making was lost. It was revived by 18th century beacon builder John Smeaton, who engineered the Eddystone Lighthouse off Plymouth Harbour. Smeaton used Portland stone bound with cement mortar to found his structure on Eddystone Rock. Previous towers and timber had not survived violent English Channel storms. Modern cement originated in 1872 and was patented as Portland cement because of the similarity to Smeaton's Portland stone. And the Wilson family's works in Walkworth, north of Auckland, produced in 1883 the first Portland cement in the Southern Hemisphere. Nathaniel Wilson bought a book, and in studying it, he adapted the works here to produce this new product. Remember, this was at a time when Portland cement was far from in general use throughout the world. Wilson's cement plath widened the scope of engineering construction, and eventually led to widespread adoption of reinforced concrete as a structural material. This new age dawned at Picton, in 1911, wharves built here were the first true use of reinforced concrete in the country. The advantages of reinforced concrete were slow to grow up to the 1931 Napier earthquake, but from that point on it has expanded into a major industry. Now the days of mixing concrete on the building site have given way to delivery from centralised batching plants. And no longer does concrete necessarily have to be hefted up the sides of buildings to be poured into floor slabs or walls. It can be pumped, thus simplifying the construction process enormously. The latest development in concrete construction technology is kitset buildings. Structural components for buildings like columns, beams, floor slabs can all be factory made and then erected on site. New buildings can be constructed in a fraction of the time it took when concrete had to be cast into boxing. But when it comes to the engineering for large sheltered spaces in industry, structural steel has some advantages over concrete. Factory fabrication in modern steel workshops, descendants of those early foundries which supplied the gold mining industry, allows speedy erection on site. Steel provides exceptionally strong but slender columns and beams and roof trusses, and considerable flexibility in structural shapes to suit particular applications. With welded and bolted joints, assembly on site is straightforward and quick. But large space engineering can also use reinforced concrete. You have to think like a bridge engineer. These arches look familiar. 
This aircraft hangar was built long after Grafton Bridge, but the design principle is similar. Instead of a bridge, we have a large covered space with no interior supports. Here's Air New Zealand's number one hangar at Christchurch, built in 1980. Look at the tremendous length of this span. All achieved by the use of modern, pre-stressed concrete bridge building techniques. Now, here's a problem. Whereas you can anchor the ends of your bridge on the bank and then extend your bridge sections out piece by piece, here, there is no bank. However, you can build your own anchor. First, your main column, then cantilever out each side. You tie down here and then start building out to meet in the center. As you go, you uh, apply weights here and here to make the structure think it has a final roof load. And when the ends meet in the middle, a huge beam will be finished in its true shape. And no sag will then occur when the roof and the doors go on. Central to all this construction activity today and for all the modern structures we've been seeing are the lessons learned from the Napier earthquake. What we see going on here are construction methods for earthquake resistant designs and these are based on engineering codes of practice that are continually being updated. Codes of practice are design rules that represent accumulated knowledge and experience of past years. It's a sharing process which begins in our schools of engineering. Professor Bob Park of Canterbury University. I think one of the keys to our success really has been the very close cooperation between what you might call the design profession and those that do the research. New Zealand is a small country and it's had the advantage that these people can easily come together and, and the designers can rapidly incorporate the results of research into design practice. And so our codes in, in fact are very good indeed. They do represent true state-of-the-art documents. Mm. New Zealanders have uh, established quite an international reputation in this area of earthquake engineering also, haven't yes. they? Yes. Well, they have really. I think you have to acknowledge that our New Zealand graduates are, form very fine engineers. Our engineering schools are getting very good students coming into them. And our structural engineers have a very high reputation. Uh, they work overseas. Our codes have been looked at by overseas countries. In many cases, some of our codes have been actually adopted or parts of them in overseas codes of practice. And so it's this involvement with overseas and also with cooperative research, uh, which has really caused this, this acceptance of our codes mm -hmm. quite widely. Mm -hmm. How are we cooperating with other countries in exploring latest developments? I think the most interesting recent one is the cooperative research project which is being developed in which there are four participating countries the countries are China, Japan, United States, and New Zealand. And each country, uh, or the laboratories of a particular university in each country, will be testing a structure designed according to their own design code. And we're going to apply the same earthquake to each of those structures. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how the behavior of those structures compares. There are two main principles to consider in reducing the earthquake risk to buildings. These masonry structures were too rigid. If they'd been able to flex and stretch, far less damage would have occurred. On top of that, strength is required to prevent earthquake damaged buildings from injuring their occupants. Since Napier, earthquake forces have been carefully studied. Equipment like this DSIR strain measuring device accumulate data on ground movement. Earthquake recorders measure shock vibrations at different locations around the country. The effects on a building from earthquake forces depend on the geological structure of the subsoil. If you fix your building on solid rock or on piles driven deep into the ground, then when the shock occurs, you get this sort of flexure. Of course, it's exaggerated here, but you can get the idea. Engineers and architects work closely together to ensure that walls and internal fittings have movement gaps to cope with small quakes. On the other hand, where you have granular soils such as deep river gravels, 
and your building has a raft foundation without piles, you have another sort of problem. Under normal circumstances, even with a high water table and the ground saturated to the surface, it's still quite firm. But under earthquake forces, the ground can suddenly liquefy. See what happens? You must have done this yourself on the beach sometime, jiggling your toes in the sand. Japanese experience with this sort of failure alerted engineers worldwide to this problem. So the key to how a building is likely to behave under earthquake forces seems to be in how you anchor the structure to its foundations. And it's in this area that an exciting New Zealand development is attracting worldwide attention. The William Clayton building here in Wellington has been built on a fault zone. So what they have done is place shock absorbers between building and foundations just like you have in a car. Looks deceptively simple, doesn't it? Engineers call it a base isolator. And this building has 80 base isolators installed between the vertical columns and the foundation pads. The rubber outer has steel slices sandwiched within it to provide strength. When we look at a modern building, we can be certain that earthquake risks have been designed for. But what about the many older buildings in our community that were erected before the current design rules were drawn up? Well, engineers have developed methods for strengthening existing buildings to resist earthquakes. After a 1942 earthquake in Wellington, the town hall was strengthened by adding these concrete buttresses. This newspaper office was built five years before the Napier earthquake and has since been strengthened for earthquake resistance. And for old masonry buildings, it is not necessary to pull them all down and rebuild. Buildings can be recycled by suitable strengthening. But it is not only in buildings that designs for probability of earthquake is important. Every structure is vulnerable. How do you design a modern railway viaduct to resist earthquake forces? Well, Becca Carter, the consulting engineers who designed this viaduct, have anticipated earthquake effects in a unique way. They've designed shock absorbers into the base of the two columns on each pair, so that under earthquake, the bridge can rock gently from side to side in a sort of stepping motion. The shock absorber in each leg of a pair can let the columns lift a few centimetres on each side as swaying occurs. So you get this stepping action with the shock absorbers then damping out the movement and helping hold the bridge down against the earthquake forces. The bridge may creak a bit, but it, it won't break as it might have without this further development in New Zealand earthquake engineering technology. In designing for earthquakes, the larger the project, the larger the potential risk of damage and disaster if things go wrong. The Clyde Dam has been about as controversial as the Arapuni Dam on the Waikato River, New Zealand's first large-scale concrete dam. Like Arapuni, public attention has been focused on the quality of engineering. This project is located near a fault line and the concern has been about earthquake safety. So how safe is it? All engineering structures, including dams, are built according to predetermined design rules. This ensures a finished product which under normal conditions is completely safe. Within those design rules is an extra element called the factor of safety, which takes into account abnormal conditions. Here at Clyde, the design rules call for the structure to resist a maximum quake force that might occur once in a hundred years. The safety factor takes into account the worst possible earthquake, so that even if damaged, the dam will survive. Thus, the structure of the Clyde Dam will be made up of 28 concrete blocks. 
One special joint has been designed to allow movement under earthquake forces without causing structural damage. It brings us back to the dilemma posed by the Tangawai Bridge. At some stage, you have to reach a balance between how much safety and how much cost of construction. The balance must be struck with care. Major earthworks such as this canal system are subject to risks associated with the variability in New Zealand's soils and rocks. Disaster struck here at precisely 1.48 p.m. on Sunday, September 20th, 1981. The bank of the canal that used to run through where you now see the pipes, it began to collapse. And within minutes, a huge rush of water draining the canal way back over its length, picked up soil and mud and whooshed down the valley to the right and into the river near the power station. With all that water, the volcanic soil stood no chance and eroded away rapidly. Fortunately, no persons were injured in this failure of the canal. What went wrong here? Was the risk of this sort of failure not properly allowed for in design? Professor Peter Taylor is an authority on soil mechanics engineering. Designing any civil engineering project is a matter of balancing the costs against the risks. And had they adopted more expensive forms of construction with a sealed canal, particularly over these uh, crucial sections, then it could have been prevented, but at considerably greater cost. When you're dealing with the natural materials of the Earth's crust, however much investigation you do, there will always be some secrets that nature holds back. And we, it's not only in New Zealand where we have such failures. Just a few months before Ruahihi failed, the Teton Dam in the United States failed. And this was designed by the US Bureau of Reclamation and had tremendous experience in di designing large earth dams yet it failed. So there, were, there is always a risk of failure. It can never be entirely eliminated. It can be reduced, usually at uh, increased expense. One of the difficulties is that the risk of failure cannot be evaluated, except in a very general sort of way. And that will never be overcome. In this case, the canal failure has been restored and valuable lessons learnt. But the public interest in engineering projects is not concerned just about risks. In 1962, the last of eight hydro power stations on the Waikato River was well underway here at Aratiatia, just downstream of Lake Taupo. The public's concern in this case was about this. Where has all the water gone? The energy wasted in the rapids could be tunneled through the hill there to be dropped into a power station in the gorge. But this meant the whole flow of the river running continuously through the power station turbines and none down the rapids. Public reaction was swift. Are engineers no more than Philistines on bulldozers? What right have the engineers to alter the environment in this way? More on this in the final program of the series.